It's obviously an unusual time in uh, the state of California. And yesterday we had the opportunity um, on our new application, the technology that we've uh, just kind of mentioned to many of you. Many of you, I'm sure, have not, not heard about it, but we got the chance to go live yesterday with two individuals, a new friend by the name of JP and Ashley, who's a part of our Bible college here, Church Home College. And uh, thank you, Ashley. Um, and we got to tell at least two stories of the horrific tragedies and disasters that have happened recently um, with the shooting in Thousand Oaks, and then literally the next day, the evacuation of so many people in the same area and other areas as well. By now, I know you're all aware, um, we're still fighting the one of, if not the worst fire in our nation's history. Um, it has affected tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And um, I want to say thank you for every single one of you that have participated, even in the smallest of way, of being a part of the solution. We exist as a community not to listen to a talk on Wednesday and sing songs that make us feel good. A good talk and good singing, ain't nothing wrong with that. But we exist to make a difference in this beautiful city and in this region and in this part of the world. And uh, we want to live and love and look like Jesus wherever we go. And so I want to thank so many of you um, who I know who've been donating your time. I've heard extraordinary stories of people here in community loving, caring, getting involved, volunteering. Thank you. Every little bit makes a difference to each and every individual. Um, so far, we have um, raised tens of thousands of dollars just from yesterday, um, we received $20,000 from a church in Alabama. And uh, all of the money, yeah, incredible, incredible. And all the money is gonna go directly. We are working with an organization, I wanna remember the name correctly, um, the California, I think it's the Calif, what's that? It's called Save, and it's, in a, it's, a, it's an outreach uh, a, uh, an incredible extension of the California Fire Organization. Forgive me, I think that's what it's called. And, and here's the program, it's extraordinary. It immediately brings resource and relief to those who have been displaced. Um, you can imagine there is insurance for a lot of people. For a lot of people, there isn't. Uh, but that takes a while, and you, you can imagine the process is long. And so what this organization is doing specifically is getting immediate care and resource to people, such as my friend JP, whose home was completely burned to the ground, and he is a contractor, a craftsman by trade, and every single one of his tools were gone, completely gone, melted, burned. And so even his way of life, his way of income, um, he has to uh, literally get new tools and resources. And so uh, we were able to literally give money to JP last night, by the way, physically hand him um, resource and cash to help him. Um, you may, you may remember, but uh, last, uh, last Wednesday when we talked about this new app, we, we talked about one of the biggest parts, what we're going to do is called Uplift. We're going to go where there are disasters and tragedies, and we're going to go on the ground and we're going to make a difference. We had no idea that the next day um, one of the worst fires in American history would break out in our backyard. Um, this, this continues. We're going to continue to raise funds. You can literally go on the Church Home app, and it says support, uplift, wildfires, um, and you can click on that. And can I just say, one dollar just means a lot. Um, and all of that is gonna go directly to helping people. Um, this is why we exist, to serve and help, stand with and aid humanity, certainly in our state, our country, and beyond. So thank you, thank you so much for your sacrifice. Thank you for considering being, be, being a part of that. Um, you know, I know it may sound strange, but it's really our honor. It's our honor to stand with people who are hurting in any way, shape, or form. It's our privilege to do so. So again, thank you for considering that if you're not already um, involved. Every time we get together, we go to this book. Um, this book is, I'm referencing, of course, the Bible. Much has been made of this book over the course of its history and human history. Uh, a lot of people have made it into uh, material to um, categorize people, marginalize people, um, to terrorize people. Uh, but this book, 
stands alone for what it is. It's been said to be a collection of morals, uh, commandments, principles, standards, but actually what it truly is is a love story. It's a story of God and his love for you and for me. And that is at its essence. And so each time we gather as a community, we go to this book and we discover again, discover again God's extraordinary love for you and for me. So if you've braced yourself tonight to find out how bad you are, um, you can exhale and relax. This community is not predicated upon or built upon telling people how bad they are. We all know we got some work to do, and we all know that we're a work in progress. I'm here to tell you tonight that there is a God who loves you and has an extraordinary plan for your life. He is not mad at you. He is crazy about you, and you're always on his mind. And four people believe that is true, so that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I'm going to go to Luke chapter 15, and we're going to read a parable that Jesus tells, and we're going to focus on the middle section of this parable. As we approach this parable, it is, should be noted, this is Jesus' explanation for why he has the friends he has. Contrary to a lot of popular opinion over the years, many people believe that uh, Jesus was this floating, angelic being who only hung out with church people, who only hung out with people who smelled nice and looked nice and talked nice. But the Bible says that Jesus was actually criticized by church pastors. Preachers and teachers and pastors and church folk didn't like Jesus all the time because the friends he made didn't look like church people, didn't look holy, didn't wear the right clothes, didn't have the right lifestyle. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all getting close to Jesus. They were magnetically drawn to Jesus and they wanted to listen to what Jesus was saying because Jesus was so attractive and so magnetic and so loving and so caring that people who knew they were doing bad things with their life were attracted to Jesus. Now, the teachers of the Torah, the Pharisees or the scribes, they, they, they blogged about Jesus, they complained about Jesus, they spread rumors about Jesus, and they said this. They said, this man receives sinners or bad people, and he even eats with them. Now, to eat with someone in antiquity or ancient time was to align yourself relationally. When you were to sit down with someone or recline with someone over a meal in Jesus' day, you are saying, I accept you. I, I, I believe in you, I love you, I open my life to you, and so it, it, it's very different today, but in Jesus' day, to eat with someone was to completely and entirely accept someone. So the teachers of the law were saying, why does Jesus accept, fully accept bad people? So Jesus tells us, he explains through a parable or through a portrait or through a story and the first section is about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and he loses one and goes after it, finds it, comes back and throws a party. The second portion of Jesus' explanation of why he has the friends he has is a woman with a coin collection. That's where we're going to spend our time tonight. It says this in Luke chapter 15 and verse 8. It says, what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep her house, Sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. Going on, and when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Jesus says in red, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God or in eternity in another realm over one person who has done wrong, who changes their thinking about God in life. Woman with 10 coins who loses one. What, what could this mean? Tonight, I want to speak to you and to me around the subject, speak to myself, to you and to myself, um, about value, about value. How valuable are you? How valuable is the person next to you? How valuable are we as individuals? I'd like to talk about the value of one life, the value of your life, or the value of another life? What is the value, based on God's perspective, what is the value of a human 
life. And I suppose my desire is that you would leave the Saban tonight feeling valuable because that would be true. You are of infinite value before God. So if you came in here and your value is connected to something temporary or something arbitrary, I am praying that tonight you'll leave here feeling the value that you actually have before God. That wouldn't be a bad thing, would it, to leave the savant feeling valuable tonight. Will you pray with me, Jesus? We thank you for the moments we share as a community. We recognize that without you, this is just a talk. This is just um, history. This is just uh, a lecture. But because of you, it turns into something supernatural that can actually begin to change our thinking and the trajectory of our life. We love you. We need you. We thank you for these moments. Help the Hawks beat the Packers tomorrow night. God, we're four and five. Lord, I need faith. Help my faith. Help our offensive line for the love of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know the Rams beat the Seahawks? Was that even on your, was that even on your radar? Do you, don't act like you care now. Don't act like you care now. Twice, thanks, bro. I appreciate the reminder. Find another church, man. Kidding, come on. Everyone's welcome. Everyone's welcome. Um, do you... Well, I think, I'll say this, I won't project on you. I think socks are underrated. I do. By me personally. I under, I, I, and, and I've had, I had a little self-talk recently. Socks are underrated. Uh, and they've been actually an issue for me of late because I don't, I don't pre-plan to have socks. But when I need them, I need them more than anything in the whole wide world. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you're like, and, 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 and of course, when you need like dark socks, you always have light socks. And when you need light socks, you always have dark socks. And when you need long socks, you always have ankle socks. And I'm just like, I need, and, and, and I've been having some issues with my socks. I'm not, I'm, I'm, this is, this is, this is, this is true. Which brings me to something very real. Chelsea and I have been robbed several times recently in the morning. Appreciate your somber response. I think some of you believe me. Well, you should, because it's been happening on a regular basis. I hear, I'll, it'll be early in the morning, and suddenly I will, I will hear our bedroom door, what I believe to be, I believe, I can't prove it because I've never seen the perpetrator, but the door slightly, I can hear it hinging, I can hear it opening, and oftentimes out of a deep sleep, I will say hello, Hello? And there's never an answer. And I swear I hear something happening in our closet. And I say, hello? Of course, I don't have the energy to get up and check, nor defend my wife. <laughs> I'm way more scared than Chelsea, just to be honest. I really am. I'm like, babe, did you hear that? Do you want to go check? <laughs> you, think I'm, you think that's a joke. It's actually real. But anyways, um, Come to find out, my two sons, I have a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old, pray for both of them. They don't believe in God. Um, I'm kidding, come on, they're great kids. But they've been stealing my socks. No, you, you think, I, I took a photo of my sock drawer. This is today, this is real time. This is my sock drawer right now. That's real. I took that at 5.30 p.m. today. What in the world? I'm sick of it. By the way, the, the, the dark sock at the bottom, it's just one. <laughs> this is what I deal with. I have provided these children with everything they have, and they come in to my closet. But I want to draw your attention to what looks to be a dirty pair of neon socks. Okay, those are clean, but I've had them for several years. Now those, this is a true story, those are my favorite socks. They're, do, do, you heard the brand Oakley. Okay, I'm not getting any money for this, this segment. Okay, just to be clear, Oakley has not sponsored this evening. Um, but a friend of mine gave me, he's sponsored by Oakley, he gave me free Oakley socks, and they have the old Oakley logo, 
Logie? <laughs> Logo. And I, I love them. They're my neon socks. And it was probably about a year ago, I went to my drawer, and I, obviously, we got issues. I couldn't find my neon socks. And boy, you should have seen me walk in the hallways of my home. I said, boys, where's my socks? Which socks? You know. Which socks? My neon. Old school throwback Oakley socks. I want them. And um, I brought down the law. Did I tell you about the person recently? He was like, you know, what I've learned about parenting is you never raise your voice as your kid, to, at your kids. Never. In fact, I never once have raised my voice. And I'm like, I can't remember the last time I didn't raise my voice at my kids. Pray for my children. They're going to be scarred. But they know as much as they have pillaged and robbed. Like, what is this? They won't touch those neon socks. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. There's a lot of things in my home worth more than those neon socks. But when I couldn't find those neon socks, I couldn't care that I owned a home. I didn't want to talk about a jacket I had. I don't care about the shoes I own or a watch. I wanted my neon socks. How much are those neon socks worth? You know what? I bet I couldn't give them to you. I bet you'd be like, that's okay. No, no, take them, please. No, I don't want to. We'd have a fight over the fact that I want you to have my precious neon socks. And you'd say, no. And I'd say, they're, they're important to me. And you'd say, I don't want, bro, these are garbage. They're not garbage to me. They're my favorite neon socks. They also represent a very special time in the life of me and my friend and some things that he accomplished. And I remember, and so those neon socks are important to me. What's hilarious is they might be the least expensive thing I own in my entire home. Like I said, you wouldn't pay 25 cents for those neon socks, and I wouldn't sell them to you <laughs> or give them to you. Those are my neon socks. You could see those socks on the street and be like, wow, that's gross. So, I mean, look, 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 just look at the, the, the twinge of color in the bottom there of those socks. Isn't it amazing? I remember walking around, here's beautiful home, beautiful family, got food in the, in, in the fridge, feel really blessed, but all I can think about is my neon socks. The kids will take every socks, but my boys know, don't touch dad's neon Oakley socks. Why? Because they're valuable to me. Doesn't really make a lot of sense. You, you can't mathematically figure this out. You, you know, use economics. You can't say, Judith, you, you, your affinity and affection for these socks isn't consistent based on the expense and the worth of your other possessions. You actually shouldn't care that much about your neon Oakley socks. You would say to me, I will buy you a whole new package of neon Oakley socks. And I would say they are not those neon Oakley socks, because those neon Oakley socks have been through some stuff. So you can't buy me these socks. Well, you know, Judah, what's the point? What, what, why are you talking about? You literally have a picture of your sock drawer up at church. What's the point? Well, the message is about value tonight. I don't know if you've noticed, but in the three verses we read from Luke chapter 15, we have a very illogical approach to value. Notice the woman. She's got 10 coins. She's got 10 coins, and she loses one of the 10 coins. Now, I don't mean to be the jerk, but like if I roll over to her house and she's tearing up her house over one coin, I'm definitely going to be the guy in her life going, hey, newsflash, hey, let's get our perspective. you still got nine. You still got nine. Nine is really close to 10. Like if you lost like half of your coin collection, I get it. But you're tearing up your house over one coin when you still got nine. Now it gets worse. It gets worse. This is not a good use of her energy or her effort. It's like, now, now by the way, we think her coins, each coin is worth a day's wage. How long did she search in her home for one coin? A whole day? She could have earned another coin by doing that. 
If you think about it, her, her affection, her affinity, her action, her effort is not consistent with the actual literal value. Why do you care so much about this coin? And it, it, it gets crazier because then she finds the coin and notice what she does. She calls friends, the Bible says, Jesus says, and neighbors. So she didn't just call people she liked. She just called people that were close. She's like, I'm going to call my friends, and I'm going to call people I don't even know very well, but they just live in the vicinity. And I'm going to throw a party that costs more than the coin I found. Think about this. Like, what is this? You are worked up about what? My neon socks. You have a house. You have a car. You have pants and a jacket. Why are you? Because those are my socks. This doesn't make any sense. What's the story and why is it relevant to why Jesus hangs out with who he hangs out with? The message is very clear before we go any further tonight that the way God ascribes value is profoundly different than we do. God sees things as valuable that we see as permissible. Just kind of, or I should say, dismissible, not permissible. <laughs> Things that we'll just dismiss. Well, I still got nine. Nine out of 10 is close. This woman tears up her whole house looking for the one coin. Then she finds it, and throws a party that we can go ahead and just, I mean, you got to feed all your friends and everybody who lives in the vicinity. So you definitely spending more than a coin to celebrate a coin. What's the point? God's love for you is illogical. You need to know that. It will not add up. You can't put it on a spreadsheet. God's love for you is illogical. This is good news, by the way. In other words, God doesn't put you on a mathematical table. God doesn't say, okay, one dumb decision. I, I love you one dumb decision less. I love you, okay, one bad day, I love you a little bit less because of your one bad day. God, God is extravagant, God is illogical. The woman is a portrait of God's love and we are a picture of the lost coin. The coin obviously has intrinsic value, but the coin also bears an image, it bears an image. And I'd like to make three observations for you tonight and for us tonight to consider how does God see value? How will you and I understand further how much God values us? Well, first of all, my first observation, which we've already started to dive into and lean into, is that, uh, well, this coin, its value is illogical. Evidently, its value is infinite. Says who? Hold on, hold on. Says who? No, we, by research and study, we can prove that that coin does have an intrinsic, and the value is a day's wage. A day's wage. But the way this woman is acting is not consistent with that's worth a day's wage. No, she's acting like it's worth a lot more than that. And I want to say this, the worth of that coin is determined by its owner. By its owner. Not what you can get for it, but what its owner says it's worth. Or more specifically, what its creator says it's worth. Tonight, we're working from a premise, in case you haven't noticed, and the premise is this, that there is a God, he is a creator, He's an intelligent being. He has designed you with a plan and a purpose. He loves you. He has not removed himself from you, but he is intimately involved with your everyday life, and he cares about you, and he wants to identify tonight with you how valuable he sees you as. He will move heaven and earth for you. Your value is infinite. I want you to let that sink in for a second. Your value is infinite. In other words, only he understands infinity. I told you about Bible Answer Man growing up. 
and I used to stutter as a kid, as a little baby boy, and so my dad was Bible Answer Man. Every night we put us to bed, it was Bible Answer Man. And he said, son, you can ask anything you want about God, anything. And my favorite thing to ask my dad about was who, 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 who was God's dad? He'd say, son, son, God doesn't have a dad. No, who, 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 who was his daddy? Son, he didn't have a dad. I have a dad. He didn't have a dad. What do you, he's always been. He'll always be. He had no beginning. He had no end. And I would say, what, what, what does that mean? And my dad would say, I don't know, son. Close your eyes. Let's pray. Go to bed. Right, like, ah! It's called infinity. It's called always is, always will be, always was. It's never, it's never, it's in, you, you have eternal, infinite value. You have eternal, infinite value. You know what's crazy about this whole story? What can a coin do on its own? I mean, what does a coin do? Think about what coins do. Coins just <laughs> sit in your pocket, sit in the cash register. And coins don't do nothing until somebody takes them and uses them. So the message is clear here from God that I know you don't understand my friends because, see, they're valuable to me not for what they can do because they're like coins. They don't do nothing. But they're valuable to me because I made them. And I get to work with them. And, and what was true of these coins is true of us. A coin in antiquity usually had the, if not always, had the image of the ruler or the emperor or the king in those days. In fact, it was one of the great honors of being a king and an emperor is that you would put your mug, you'd put your face on every coin. And that coin was a declaration of your power. That coin was a declaration of your authority. That coin was a declaration of your presence. That coin was a declaration of your rulership. That coin had your image on it. Jesus is saying, you don't understand why I hang out with who I hang out with because you think I'll hang out with people because of what they do. No, no, I hang out with people because people is who I made and I love them all because I'm the creator, and I made them in my image. They have my image. Do, do you remember that time somebody asked Jesus about taxes? So we're like, we're talking about taxes in church? Bear with me. But some people said, hey, Jesus, should we, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And, of course, if you were a Jew in those days, Caesar represented idol worship. He represented this, this, tier, this tyrannical leader. And, and they said, Jesus, should we really pay taxes to Caesar? And he says, do you have a coin? And somebody's like, yeah, I got a coin. Here's a coin. Jesus says, whose image is on this coin? By the way, that's a really big coin. <laughs> Um, <laughs> whose image is on this coin? And everybody's like, uh, you know, Caesar's. And he goes, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And then he says, but give to God what is God's. Oh, Jesus is great at answering politically charged questions. <laughs> he says, go ahead and give it to Caesar because I see him on the coin. But don't forget, wherever you see the image of God, well, that belongs to God. And at the beginning of the time, Genesis chapter 1, the Bible starts off with God saying, let us, Father, Son, and Spirit, let us make man in our image, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And it says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps. Verse 20, I love that, over all the creeps. And then verse 27, 
So God, listen to the redundancy. So God created the man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, it says own image and in the image, but if you look it up in the original language, the Hebrew there says he created man in his own image and, 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 and shared his nature. We share 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 his nature. Where do we come up with all these stories we tell? Think about it. There seems to always be a bad guy, and there seems to always be a good guy. There seems to always be a champion, and there seems to always be somebody who wants to just ruin everything for everybody. Where do we get this? It's in our nature. In our nature, we know good and evil. In our nature, we know bad. We know wrong. It's in our, because we're in his image and we're unique from the other creatures on the earth. Though, by the way, it all belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And somebody recently said, I love animals. And I'm, I just want to remind you, so does God. He made them. Animals are beautiful to God. And I think it's an amazing story to hear people in the midst of these horrific fires, not only saving fellow human beings, but also having a heart and saving animals. It's a beautiful thing. But unique amongst all the creatures is the human being, for we share the nature, the imprint, and the image of God. And that and that alone ascribes infinite, eternal value to you and to me. Now, give to God what is God's. Now, I know that sounds kind of rough in, 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 uh, in that passage, but in Mark chapter 12, when Jesus says that, what he's saying is actually it's an affection. He's saying, you're mine. In the same way that Caesar desires to have all the wealth, so God desires to have all of his children. He loves you. You're his. Now, if you've ever had babies, or if you know somebody who's had babies, or you love somebody else's babies. You know what it's like when it's like, I, I, can, I can no more, den I would rather deny myself than my babies. That's flesh of my flesh, that's bone of my bone. That boy looks like me. That's my guy. That's my baby girl. That is my child. You are mine. It is, it is my Honor. When I walk around town talking about this, this is my girl, this is my girl, it's my girl Grace, it's my son L Dog, this is Zion, he's 14, he's 12, he's nine. Do you want to see photos when they were younger though? Would you want to see kind of their whole kind of kind of timeline? It's beautiful. They, they've all just, just would you like to see? because those are my babies. Part of my honor is to remind them how valuable they are to their father. And so it is with God, you are, you are his. So tonight, though it's hard to comprehend, you are, of, you are loved illogically. And your value is actually, it, it, it cannot be quantified. It cannot be quantified, your value. Your value, your value. Oh God, let us be proponents of the infinite value and dignity of every human being. Now, if you want to tick God off, I have a suggestion. Demean one of his kids. Belittle one of his boys or girls. I dare you to say something bad about my kids. I will go to jail following our interaction. <laughs> and, and, then, and then people will say, now, Pastor, do you, or do you feel sorry for what you did? I said, no, I'll do it again. Where is he? You know, like, I mean, it's your, it's your babies. It's amazing how quickly we forget that each and every person bears his image. Another observation in the next few moments as we conclude, and in, in, in a few minutes the, the band will join us and we'll sing a few songs about God. In our story, we see that the coin is, is, is not easily found, but the search is relentless. The coin, notice what she says. It says, and, and, and she, she, she lights a lamp, which is to say she, she, she lights a candle. She gets out a broom, 
and starts sweeping the dimly lit house. And notice she seeks diligently. This is interesting. There's no, and of course the story before, the story before, the shepherd, it says he went out looking for the one sheep, left 99, went out looking for the one sheep, and he was out there until dark? No. He was out there until he was tired? No. Out there until it was uncomfortable? No. He was out there until he found the sheep. She was sweeping diligently until she heard the coin in the cracks of the uneven ancient floor. She, she, she sought diligently. What's, what's the message? People think that God gives up on them. People think God gives up. God, 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 God doesn't know how to give up. I don't even think God could be God if he gave up. God does not get fatigued. God does not get weary. God is not mad at you? No, God, here's the picture of the woman. She's probably got stone floors that are uneven. Her home is dimly lit even in the day. If she's got a traditional home in antiquity in Jesus' time, it's not a big home. It might be just a one-room home, and she's got stone, and it's uneven. And when you lose a coin, you light some candles, and what you do is you use a broom, and you're not so much looking for the sight of the coin because you're unlikely to see it, but what she's doing with a hush, she's listening for the sound of the coin against the stones. See, Jesus wants you to know. He said, man, you guys don't understand who I hang out with because you don't understand my heart. You don't understand my approach. I understand that people are broken and hurting, and I'm like a woman who is quietly, delicately, attentively listening while sweeping her floor, hoping to find, and she's moved all the furniture, everything. She won't even eat. She's not, she just, all she can think about is the coin, and she will, she will stay here until she finds it. Well, I mean, I, 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 think, I think God might be real, but I think God gave up on me a long time ago. I, I don't understand. Well, if you knew, kind of see, I grew up kind of knowing like that God, but then I started, you know, doing stuff, and I mean, you know how it is. You kind of want to get out there and experience life and kind of see what it has to offer. You get it. And so I, I guess, like, for me, probably God is not, you know, like, it's probably not my thing. So, but I get it, man. I, you know, that's on me, you know. I kind of, and the narrative gets out there that God is like you and me. I mean, I, I've looked for stuff in the house, and here's what I conclude when I can't find it. Oh, it'll turn up. You know what I'm talking about? Talk about socks. I cannot find a matching partner ever. Tonight, I am wearing two different dark socks. That is a fact. That's the truth, because I couldn't find the proper partner. It, it'll turn up. That's our nature. It'll turn up. It'll turn up. God, because of your value to him, this is his posture. God won't give up on you. I, I just, I, I, and, and I know that sounds really awesome and sensational, but it also is going to be really uncomfortable. I'm here to tell you God won't give up on you. Some of you are here tonight because God won't give up on you. Some of you are here tonight because God keeps interrupting your regularly scheduled program. You're like, God, what are you doing? I'm sweeping. I'm sweeping. I'm looking for you. I just, I miss you. All right, well, this is, what? just let me be. I'm just one Person, yeah, but you're 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 mine. I, you you look like me. I I I I I I I I love you. I love you. I love you. I swore um, when I. Well, I mean, I don't swear all the time, but I swore um, that I wouldn't be that dad when my kids finally started playing sports. And then I was like, ah, forget it. And like the first soccer, wait for it, practice my kids had <laughs> practice. Zion gets a breakaway. He's like four. Blonde hair blowing in the wind. And I just, it was like a kind of a pseudo scrimmage. You know, basically it was just like a pack of kids around a ball. 
and it, the ball like popped out on accident and Zion was like, oh. And just like his head kind of leaned, gave him momentum. And I start running down the sideline. Zion! Zion! He's like, ah! Kick the ball! Kick the ball! Kick the ball! He kind of trips, kicks it accidentally. It trickles in. The goalie is like, you know, playing with one of the posts, and it trickles in. I'm like, go! Taking off my shirt. (laughs) And then it hits you, and you look around, and moms are sitting on their Yeti coolers going, really? And then you just got to own it. That's my boy! It's my guy! You know, Zion gets in the car. What's it like, son? You scored a goal. He goes, Daddy, what does a goal mean? And I'm like, never mind. Don't tell anyone that you don't know what a goal is. I don't know how to tell you this, but I, I can't give up on my boys. I just can't. It's not in me to give up on them. I just can't. I tell them that all the time. I'm not saying this is like a great parenting tactic, but I'm like, hey, look, if you go to prison, I'm still going to love you. Like, who says that to their kids? You know, like, you preparing them for that kind of life? But it's true, though. I just, I can't, I can't deny them. Those are my boys. We fail to recognize that God is not just some removed deity. He reminds us over and over and over in his love story that he is a father who is heavenly. He says, if you earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly father will give good gifts to those who ask. The fact is, he's crazy about you. And he's running down the sideline of your life, whether you like it or not. And I know sometimes it's embarrassing and inconvenient and uncomfortable. And some of you are wondering like, man, I just can't. I just wanna have a fun evening where I do whatever I want. But then I do it and I feel like God's somehow there and it sucks. And so my dad used to pray over me. I'd be a bad sinner, just bad at it. <laughs> Maybe that worked, I don't know. But, but God's crazy about you. I mean, this, like if you came over to this lady's house, you'd be like, are you? Let's say her name is Sue. Sue, are you, are you okay? Yeah, why, why? You've been at this for hours, right? Yeah, 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 I know. It's, it's here somewhere. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not, Sue. And you still got nine coins. That's most of your collection. Yet I got to find the one. Oh, that's Sue, I, let's get on with life. No, 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 no. This is, I, I'm going to keep doing this until I find, what if it never happens? I'm going to keep doing it. That's what people fail to realize. People believe that God is only relentlessly after those that he knows will respond to his love. But that's where you misappropriate God's extraordinary, illogical, eternal, extensive love. God is running down the sidelines of people's lives who will never acknowledge him ever. He can't help it. He can't help it. I've had moments my oldest son's like, Dad, stop it. I'm like, you stop it. I will be here until you're 48. It's my son. Dad. It's a conference room. I'm a businessman. I'm 45. You know, like, <laughs> sorry, but not sorry. That's God. I'm sorry you've been told otherwise, but that's God. So come on, give it a rest. I can't. I can't. No, the search is, the search is relentless. And lastly, in conclusion, It's apparent to me that the coin is, it is lost. We have to admit that. It's definitely lost. But the image isn't gone. Please hear me in conclusion. The coin cannot be seen, but the image is still on the coin. Though you can't see the coin, the image is still there, which is to say, the value remains even though the coin is displaced. 
That's why people can't understand that when these Pharisees and Sadducees in John chapter 8 bring a woman naked on the streets of the city and they say to Jesus, we found this woman displaced in a bed that is not her own with a man she's not married to. She's lost. Jesus, what do you say? Now let's be clear. The men circling this woman who is maybe clothed at all, she's clothed by a sheet in the middle of the street. They're surrounding her and what they're saying is she no longer has the value that we have. And you know why? Because according to these men, value is something that reflects what you do. What you do. Maybe you can relate. So we, in our culture, we value people based on what we do. I'm not saying we don't honor people for great accomplishments. I have no problem with that. The problem I have is we devalue people who don't do things we believe are good or great or upstanding and we believe their value has been diminished. So we conclude if a person is lost or broken or displaced, they've lost their value. That's why churches don't feel bad for opening up their doors to everybody. Because churches believe that if you're lost, you're not as valuable as those who aren't. But see, the coin can't be found yet, but it still bears the image, which speaks to the fact that it still retains its value. And that's why Jesus, 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 he, he, when the woman's in the street and they're saying, we should kill her, she should die because she's not valuable anymore. Jesus gets down twice and puts his finger in the dirt. And the last time we saw God's finger in the dirt was in Genesis when he made man in his image. And Jesus has his finger in the dirt as a declaration to you and to me to say, she still has my image. She's still mine. She may be lost, she may be broken, but she's still mine. And I didn't make her for this, but I also didn't make these men for this. I didn't make you to hurt each other and oppose each other and berate each other and belittle each other. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, that's not what I made you for. So there's people here tonight, you feel lost, you feel displaced, you feel discombobulated, and you think somehow, and maybe you feel less valuable, but I'm here to say that you have retained your value before God. You've retained your value before God. He, he loves you so much. <laughs> he loves you so much. And I pray, you know, and I, I guess I just, I dream of a church who joins the party, and here's what I mean, and I end with this. The woman says to her friends and her neighbors, she sends out an RSVP let's say, and she says, will you join me tomorrow? I'm throwing a big old party. Now, usually, when you send out invitations, you give the reason why. It's so-and-so's birthday. My son just came home. This, her RSVP says, I found a coin. Now, if I get that, I mean, if I get that invitation, I'm like, come celebrate with your neighbor, Sue. Occasion. I found my coin. <laughs> Please RSVP and regrets. Now, what, what does my brain tell me? What does my brain tell me? We're going to have a party? Over one coin, we, somebody call Sue <laughs> and tell her 
this just doesn't make sense. And that's how a lot of communities like ours are. Wait, we're going we to, I mean, we're going to celebrate one person? Yeah. We go, wait, we're spending money on what? We do, wait, how much? That's right. We're going to spend so much money on people. We're going to raise millions and billions of dollars and give it all away. We're going to ask people to RSVP. They're going to be like, wait, wait, you did? Wait, what? Yeah. What if we were the kind of church that when someone said, hey, want to come? Dude, I'm throwing a massive party. You're like, whoa, yeah? What's the occasion? I found a coin. Awesome! Yes! Wow. Wow. Ashley said yesterday, as we were talking about the fires where she's grown up in Thousand Oaks, as we started the interview, Ashley said something so profound. She's, I believe Ashley's here tonight. She said, I first of all want to say thank you. There you are, Ashley. There you are. Look, right in the middle of the whole room, of course you are. Right in the center of it all. Ashley said this, Ashley right there. She said, first of all, I want to say thank you because I feel seen. I feel seen. Ooh, to be a part of a church where we see the individual, where we see people and celebrate people. That's awesome. That's the God we're here celebrating. So if you feel marginalized, if you feel overlooked, if you feel unheard, if you feel unseen, I'm here to remind you there is a God who is intimately, attentively, actively involved in every moment of your existence. And your value before him and in this universe cannot be quantified. You are more valuable than you could ever possibly imagine. And I'm gonna tell you this world is not the same without you. And God has named you, he's identified you. The Bible says before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you, he knows the hairs on your head. You are more valuable than a thousand lilies in the valley. God chooses you, he loves you. You walk out of this auditorium tonight with your true value. You hear me? Let us remind each other that my value does not come from what I do or don't do. It comes from who made me and declared value in my life. Can I hear an amen? Will you join me in prayer, Jesus? We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We live in a, in a time and an age and a world where value has become so wonky and, and, and confusing and hard to grasp. So we ask tonight that again, you would center us around what you say and the value you give us. Lord, for those of us that right now feel like we're on cloud nine and life is so good and we've accomplished so much and we feel so valuable, I pray you would take these words and just put them in their soul for safekeeping. And oh God, for those who are here tonight who feel so low, who feel so little, who feel so unimportant, because lately there hasn't been a lot of accomplishments there hasn't been a lot of successes. Oh God, I pray that you would be with the broken and the hurting and those who feel disoriented, feel like they don't understand where they fit or how much they're worth. I ask right now that you be present to them, more present than the air we breathe. Thank you for your bigness and your reality in this room. If you're here tonight and you say, Judah, I, uh, I believe and I would like to accept Jesus as God. 
But the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever simply believes in him receives the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus offers. He will live forever. He will not perish, but have everlasting life. For the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard. All of us have erred and done wrong. And the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. But Jesus moved into the neighborhood and he became sin so that you and I could become right with God. It's as simple as that. And by simply believing and receiving, we're right with our creator forever and ever. And we begin to experience true, lasting fulfillment and meaning. If you want that tonight, there is absolutely no pressure. Please do not feel pressure. This is simply an invitation for those who feel so compelled, who are so convinced that God is real and only Jesus can forgive. If that's you on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to slip up your hands and put it right back down and I'm gonna count to three. The reason I ask people to raise their hand is I truly believe when you respond on the outside to what's happening on the inside, it becomes all the more real to you. You know who you are. One, God loves you. Two, believe you'll never be the same. Three, if that's you, would you shoot your hand up all over the auditorium and say, man, I believe and I receive. So God, you see these hands and most importantly, you see our hearts. And we thank you that forgiveness flows freely in this space and in this place. And in these moments, God, as we sing, in these moments as we use music as a platform to connect with you, we pray that you would, we would sense your nearness, your attention, your attentiveness, your love, your care, your concern, and your value for each and every one of us. Thank you, Jesus. If you're physically able, willing, would you stand with us? And let's join the band and let's sing together. Whoa, hey buddy. You guys see, it's the subscribe button. If you press on it, you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you get to watch it and we get to have fun and we get to be friends. I love you, subscribe. <laughs>